Students, I think, would benefit from choosing SWAC because it gives them an opportunity to get involved at a more hands-on level earlier in their career. Students choosing to come to SWAC benefit from having opportunities at the freshman and sophomore level to get involved in research that can carry them forward in their career while still maintaining the same academic rigor as they would experience at, at a four-year institution. The day in the classroom in physics and engineering starts out as sort of a conversational approach to the material that we're looking at, whether it be solving rocket science problems, whether it be designing bridges, whether it be designing electrical circuit systems. It's usually a conversational approach that leads to a lot of questions. I always tell students if they're doing science well, they'll always leave science class with more questions than they got answers to begin with. And that's to drive the intellectual curiosity of the students. And that's what I try to do, making things as interactive as possible and letting them foster that curiosity and develop those critical thinking and teamwork skills that they need to succeed as they go forward. You're dealing with a class in physics that is typically between 10 and 20 students. That gives you plenty of time to interact, ask questions. You get more direct responses from the instructor. And SWAC being a small enough school, there are instructors that you will see a number of times. So you get to develop sort of a rapport with your instructors and truly do become more like mentors than they do become teachers. The biggest thing it brings is a sense of opportunity. It gives us a chance to revisit how our curriculum works. It gives us a chance to incorporate new ideas, new equipment, and it also provides the students with ample opportunity for new projects and new developments in terms of research. The physics and engineering programs at Southwestern are a great way to begin your journey in a professional STEM career. Welcome everyone, and welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Um, as you could hear, we kind of have something that we play ahead of time. We just had to wait a few minutes before we got started. Uh, it's so nice to see so many people in uh, our beautiful Umpqua Hall. Um, so if this is your first time, welcome to South Southwestern Oregon Community College. Uh, my name is Crystal Hopper Myers. I am our uh, STEAM Pathways Assistant and our Oregon NASA Space Grant uh, Consortium's PRISMS Project Coordinator. It's kind of a long title there. But um, so I uh, assist Dr. Coiner on various uh, things going on with our physics and engineering department. We have an awesome uh, student research team. Uh, they're, they call themselves SPEAR. And they're working on a variety of projects right now looking for micrometeorites, uh, they're also working uh, to look for never discovered asteroids. Um, and so that's been really neat. Uh, we have uh, another group working on uh, an electric powered engine for uh, aircraft to um, help figure out ways to extend flight time uh, with that. Um, and another exciting piece of my position is uh, not only now with the STEAM Pathways being able to assist the other departments, uh, but we have a, a great program that is a K-12 STEM outreach, which I've been able to uh, jump out there and work with uh, a lot of our local educators in various elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. Uh, we recently had a, a STEAM Academy where we had an awesome group of students that were 7th to 12th grade. Uh, kids that came and spent four awesome days with us. I actually think I saw one here today, so that was pretty exciting. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> but um, we had so much fun. Um, the kids got to come in here. We, we actually came in this room every day in the morning and in the, in the afternoon, in the evening uh, to kind of get things started and wrap up the day. And they got to go, uh, they were able to go and, and learn from uh, instructors uh, like Dr. Coiner um, with physics and engineering, they were able to uh, uh, learn from chemistry and biology professors, um, geology, um, just 
anthropology, everybody. And it's, it was awesome. We had an awesome art instructor here that uh, was able to also um, help them with creating a piece of pottery that they were able to um, take home with them. So hopefully they really enjoyed that experience and we hope to do more of those types of things here uh, with our K-12 outreach. We think, uh, and me personally, I, I, I also am just very passionate about reaching out uh, to uh, the younger generation and getting them and keeping them excited about science. Um, and uh, with the STEAM, um, if kind of confusing sometimes to understand that, uh, the STEM is the science, technology, engineering, and math, and then STEAM, we're just adding the art piece uh, so that we can, um, as you'll be able to see in different ways uh, uh, that art can um, connect it all together. And with that said, we actually currently have an art exhibit, uh, one of our uh, student art exhibits that we do every year uh, on display over at Eden Hall. And they will have that building, building open till nine o'clock tonight if you'd like to go over to the gallery and see it. Um, it is uh, on display and it, it uh, talks about our Voyager missions in the past we've had celebrating 30 years of Hubble. We've done um, all types of things. So. I'm uh, just really excited for you guys all to be here. And thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Reif with uh, Rice University uh, for coming all this way from Houston to come and speak to us. Uh, Dr. Pointer is going to talk to you guys for a minute. And again, thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. I was actually looking forward to this talk as a as a solar physicist. Any time that we get to to focus on anything sun related, it usually it's 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 one of one of my uh, most favorite talks because it ties into stuff that I that I have spent many a year looking at. Um, but I was particularly proud of this one because I got a chance to invite uh, Dr. Reif from Rice University to come out and talk to us. Uh, I went to grad school at Rice, and Dr. Reif was actually one of my one of my graduate school professors. She's also one of the uh, leaders at, at Rice in terms of their K-12 outreach and a lot of their space science outreach activities. And she's also the um, founder of ePlanetarium, which is a company that uh, specializes in uh, digital inflatable planetarium domes, which we were lucky enough at SWAC to actually purchase one a few months ago, and we will be using it for upcoming outreach throughout the throughout the next few years. Uh, with the eclipses coming, it seemed like a very good opportunity to uh, have Dr. Reif come up, uh, teach us how to use the planetarium, and give us a little bit of how to observe and different outreach activities you can do for for the eclipses, particularly the annual eclipse here in here in Coos Bay in October, and the total solar eclipse in April that goes through the southern and eastern United States. But with that, I will I will turn things over to Dr. Reif, and uh, floor is yours. Thanks. Um, I knew Doc Coiner back when he was graduate student Coiner. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's great to be uh, be back here in uh, in Oregon. Um, I was a good friend with Reggie Dufour, who was uh, Aaron's advisor. And uh, when he passed away a few years ago, I was here for his memorial service, and uh, it's good to be back. So um, <clears throat> as he said, I'm I'm a, I'm an eclipse junkie. I'm a veteran of 19 times on the center line. Uh, two annulars and uh, 17 totals. And of those, I've only been clouded out three times, so I figure that's pretty <laughs> pretty good odds. Uh, anything, anytime uh, you have something that's dependent on the weather, it's always uh, 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 a little scary as to whether it's gonna be clear skies or not. And uh, uh, when, uh, when Aaron mentioned uh, that I might come up, and he he asked me to give a talk, and I said, well, you know, you guys are right in the path of the annular. You're actually closer to the center line of the annular than we are, 
in Houston. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to come. <clears throat> so um, this is, uh, I've, I've given variations of this talk to about 10,000 people already so far <laughs> uh, this year. And uh, so um, some of it is pre-recorded because my voice goes out. Uh, but I did want to uh, make sure everybody picked up uh, outside uh, one of my maps, and it has a pair of eclipse glasses in it, and it shows you uh, both the path of the annular and the path of the total, and, and gives you a, a place to keep your glasses uh, clean and not scratched. And then on this sheet, it gives you some more of the circumstances for this area uh, as to what time and where to look. Okay, so let, that said, uh, what my research is <clears throat> not typically op, uh, observational astronomy, but really is more in the area of space weather. And, uh, you know, <laughs> first question is, you know, what's space weather? Uh, is it Earth weather seen from space? Uh, and <clears throat> no, <laughs> but, but space weather is important. And uh, well, that is one of the things I do is space weather forecasting. And we've had some amazing uh, solar outbursts in the last uh, week or two, including just yesterday. So uh, be on the lookout for auroras around here. Uh, instead, space weather is how changes on the sun affect the Earth's magnetic field, ionosphere, and its environment. Uh, and one of these large outbursts is called a coronal mass ejection, or CME. <clears throat> and uh, those are the ones that really give us the amazing auroras when they get here. So, um, so my field is space plasma physics. And, uh, you know, it's not the plasma that, you know, you give to the Red Cross. Uh, but it's, it is the fact that electrons and ions uh, together act like a fluid. And um, because it takes energy to break those electrons off of the, uh, off of the atoms, it takes a very hot uh, gas to become ionized, either a very hot gas or one that's being irradiated by energetic particles and energetic photons. And that's what it is in our ionosphere. The, the ultraviolet light from the sun uh, ionizes our upper atmosphere. Uh, but there's very few plasmas that you can really see in your, in your everyday life. Uh, the aurora borealis and, and the comet tails are, are two of the most uh, beautiful. But my favorite, of course, is the corona. And <clears throat> the phases of a solar eclipse are kind of indicated here uh, that the moon uh, gets between us and the sun and, uh, and eventually covers it up. And when the uh, last bit of sun uh, is just being covered up, that's called the diamond ring for obvious reasons. Uh, well, we are now going into solar maximum. That means the sun is in its very active stage. Uh, there's a lot of coronal mass ejections. There's a lot of, of uh, solar flares. Uh, and, and when you have an eclipse at solar minimum, uh, these streamers, these are called helmet streamers, are primarily along the sun's equatorial plane, whereas the magnetic fields at the sun's poles are radial and go out into space. Uh, the, the phase of the moon uh, during a <clears throat> solar eclipse is new, uh, and so... Uh, this dark side of the moon, when it's noon, we normally can't see. Uh, but in, a, in, a, uh, in an eclipse, when you've blocked out the sunlight, it's lit by earth shine because it's full earth at the moon. And so these are actually some of our best pictures before the space age of the dark side of the moon, or the far side of the moon, I should say. <laughs> the dark, when it's, it's dark when it's, it's still the near side of the moon, but it's dark for us. Uh, we're do, is during uh, uh, solar eclipses. Now this is gonna be a solar maximum eclipse. And a solar maximum eclipse is different in a couple of very obvious ways. And the, the, the most obvious one is, look how symmetric it is. The, these coronal rays come off on all sides. 
This was taken last, this, this most recent April uh, in Australia, uh, and a solar, nice solar maximum eclipse. And you can see these little loops. That's the loops of the magnetic field. And these little red ones along the edge are called prominences, and they're either jets or loops that you'll see along the, the boundary. <clears throat> so here's, here's the path. And you guys are in really wonderful uh, situation to see the annual eclipse. For you, it'll be uh, in the morning. Uh, for us, it'll be uh, near noon. And then it goes on into Central and South America, where it'll be late afternoon. Uh, so that's Saturday, the, the 14th of October. It's not that far away, guys. <laughs> and then uh, the next uh, April, the path of the total solar eclipse uh, comes this way, and you have to be in the green path in order to see uh, totality. Uh, similarly, you have to be in the orange path to see the, the sun turn into a ring, and sometimes it's called the ring of fire. Okay, so eclipses in a given location are not very common. So here are all the total solar eclipses between 2000 and 2050 uh, for North America. Uh, here is the 2017 eclipse that many of us saw. And again, you guys had a really wonderful uh, view of it, uh, uh, of the t of totality near here. I, I was in Montana. Um, excuse me, I was in Wyoming. Uh, and um, and it went across the United States in 2017. Uh, this is the one coming up in 2024. And uh, the next total eclipse after this one uh, will be in 2045. So 21 years later uh, will be the next eclipse to cross the United States. Uh, the previous one that came through the United States was 1979. And the previous one to come through Texas was 1878. Uh, so it's pretty rare. And so it's those of us who are eclipse chasers, uh, as a bonus, we get to go visit neat places because we have to go around the world to see them. Uh, this one is the map of all the annular eclipses. And there was a nice annular eclipse in 2012 uh, coming this way. And and the, the one in a few weeks is going to follow a very similar path, both both went through Albuquerque, uh, and and again, I'm going to be uh, viewing it uh, down in Corpus Christi. Uh, so these are the paths of the annular eclipses. But there's generally at least a partial solar eclipse every year, um, which might be annular or not. Okay, so um, what is a lunar eclipse versus a solar eclipse, and where were you able to see it? I really recommend these three websites. And, and by the way, all of these links and a lot of these images are on my website, which is space.rice.edu slash eclipse, and it's on this map. So the, the web, my website is on this map, and if you go to my resources page, it'll point to, to, to these. So timeanddate.com I really recommend. You can put in your city and it will tell you what it's what the next eclipses you'll be able to see. Eclipse2024.org is another one really good for these two eclipses. Um, this one, xjubier.free.france, uh, this one has an interactive Google Maps, which are great. Uh, and all of these, you can then find your circumstances for whatever location you're going to be observing from. So like... <clears throat> For the annular eclipse in Houston, we won't quite be annular. We have to go a little bit south and west to get to be a full annular. So we get a pretty good coverage, about 85% coverage uh, for the annular and about 94% uh, coverage for the total. But as anybody will tell you, 95% is not good enough. If you're near totality, get into totality because Totality is an amazing all-body experience that is definitely worth the time and trouble to get there. <clears throat> now, for you all, 
Uh, you will see the full ring. It'll be a little bit off center because you're not quite on the center line, but you will have a full ring annular. And uh, the partial eclipse will begin about eight o'clock. Uh, the uh, annular goes from 916 to 920, so about four minutes of, of annularity and then another hour and a half coming out. So the moon crosses uh, the sun relatively slowly. And now for the total, because you're not very close to it, uh, you're not going to get that much uh, coverage, but it will be visible in, uh, in uh, solar, uh, solar shades or solar binoculars. Uh, and it will be uh, also in the morning with a maximum eclipse for you about 1120 in the morning. For in, uh, in Texas, it will be exactly at, at solar noon, which is about 120 in the afternoon. Okay, so if, if you get to go uh, to totality, that's when you're able to see uh, the, two, the, the full eclipse. Uh, and this is this exuber.free.france. And so you can drill down you know, to your backyard and get exactly uh, the time that, that it starts and stops. And if you're in totality, it'll tell you how, when it begins. Uh, but it's in universal time. So you have to uh, uh, subtract or add uh, to, to get between uh, universal time and, and uh, Pacific daylight is seven hours difference. So you subtract seven hours. And then, if you have a if you have a, um, a, a, a planetarium program, sort of like Stellarium, and Stellarium is free. You can download it on a Mac or PC or, or Linux for free, uh, and you can recreate the uh, eclipse for you in your location. You can put in your uh, latitude and longitude. Okay, and and one of the things we may have is is a, a comet may be visible in totality. So we're all keeping an eye on that. We also have a comet visible now, which I don't think it's going to be dark enough to see, but we might. There might be, uh, uh, there, you guys might be able to see the, uh, the comet uh, for this one. There's a different comet for this one. Okay, so if you can go to totality, you don't want to be near the edge of totality because the length of totality is really short when you're along the edge, but anything in the middle three quarters is fine. Uh, the traffic's gonna be crazy. Uh, so, you know, if you think you can drive two hours, you know, make it six or eight. Uh, and uh, a lot of hotels are full, uh, but you can find a hotel about an hour away and drive into totality for the day. <clears throat> okay, so one of the things that we do is we create animations uh, that we can put inside our planetarium dome. And, and so I'm going to show you a couple of animations that were actually created for the dome. And if you're lucky, you'll get Dr. Corn Corner to show you this, <laughs> our totality movie, our show on totality, uh, and which has some of these animations in it, in the, where you should see it, which is in the dome. Okay, so again, a solar eclipse is the moon casting its shadow on the Earth. A lunar eclipse is the Earth casting its shadow on the moon. And totality means the entire sun will be blocked out. <clears throat> I, have, I had a, had a t-shirt, I almost wore it. It had, you know, it had sun, Earth, moon, lunar eclipse, sun, moon, Earth, solar eclipse, Earth, sun, moon, apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> now, in a lunar eclipse, the, the, the moon turns red, and sometimes they call it a blood moon. Uh, by the way, blue moons are not blue colored. They're only blue because they're the second full moon in a month, okay? A lot of people said, I didn't look blue to me. Uh, yeah, it's not blue actually <laughs> but but a, uh, a a lunar eclipse turns red because the blue light is scattered out of earth's atmosphere that's why the sky looks blue to us and when we're standing at sunset 
the sun looks red to us because all the blue has been taken away. Well, that same light is the light that gets scattered and, and paints the moon. So the only light that can reach the moon during a total lunar eclipse is comes from sunset or sunrise, uh, red light from the sun with the blue had been taken away. <clears throat> All right, so whereas a solar eclipse, uh, the umbra, the deepest part of the shadows, the umbra, and uh, it only reaches a re re relatively narrow uh, part of Earth. And anybody that's in the penumbra just sees a partial eclipse. Um, now, the only time it's safe to view the sun or a partial or annular eclipse with naked eyes is only at sunrise and sunset. You guys know that, right? You don't go out in the noon and stare at the sun. Uh, why, why do people worry about staring at the sun during an, an eclipse? Uh, the reason that it's, it's more dangerous during an eclipse is that the sky is getting dark. Your pupils are opening up. It seems dark to you, okay? And normally when it's that dark, the sun is setting and it's, you're looking at it through a lot of atmosphere, all the blue light's gone, and it's, it's okay to, to look for briefly at the sun when it's setting, okay? That's how Galileo found sunspots. Um, but the, the worry is that when that sun gets to be a little narrow crescent and, and it's dark, you, you have a tendency to look at it too long and you'll burn that, that image of that crescent sun in your retina. And that's why we really are trying to make sure that everybody uh, pays attention and, and protects their eyes uh, during, the, during the eclipses. I remember one time after, after the 2017 event, uh, one of the uh, late night uh, uh, talk show hosts said, uh, uh, okay, everybody, the eclipse is over. It is now safe to stare at the sun directly. <laughs> All right, well, anyway. <clears throat> when the new moon passes exactly in front of the sun, its shadow crosses the earth. The deepest part of the shadow is called the umbra. People in the umbra see a total solar eclipse. It takes about an hour for the shadow to cross the earth. Two weeks later, the full moon can cross into Earth's umbra. Since the Earth is four times the diameter of the moon, the umbra is also four times larger, or 16 times the area. So, lunar eclipses are more common than solar eclipses. Everyone on the night side of Earth can see a total lunar eclipse, but only people in the narrow strip of totality can see a total solar eclipse. So, not only are lunar eclipses more common, more people can observe each one. An annular eclipse happens when the moon is farther from Earth than usual. The deepest part of the shadow is called the umbra. Only if you are in the umbra can you see a total solar eclipse. Since the umbra doesn't reach the Earth, no one can see totality. And so it is not safe to view a partial or annular eclipse without eye protection. Since the moon doesn't cover the entire sun, a ring of sunlight remains. It is called annular eclipse because annulus means Okay, so you have to keep your filters on during an annular eclipse. There's no time that you can take your filters off, okay? Or you can use projection techniques, and I'll show you some of those in just a minute. This animation shows the view of an annular eclipse as much as seen from the Earth's So you 
So if you're not in the center of the path, the ring won't be symmetric, but you'll get a ring in, in, if you're anywhere in that path. Okay, so the phases of the eclipse, the first contact is when the moon starts to cover the sun. Second contact, the moon is completely covering it. It's, it's the beginning of totality. Third contact is the end of totality. And fourth contact is the end of the eclipse. First contact is when the disk of the moon first starts to cover the sun. During the partial phases, you must use solar filters As the last bit of the moon leaves the sun, it is fourth contact and the end of the eclipse. Okay, so if you go to totality, these are the kinds of things you'll see. The outer part is called the corona, okay, and these streamers that come out are called helmet streamers because they kind of go to a peak at the top almost like the German helmets. <laughs> uh, the red loops are called prominences and you can really see the magnetic field lines. I mean, which is very weird. How can you see magnetic field lines? Well, you're not really seeing the magnetic field lines. What you're seeing is sunlight scattered off of electrons that are trapped on the magnetic field lines. And an electron, when it sees a magnetic field, it has a velocity and a magnetic field, and then you go to the minuses, it's a negative charge. So an electron, when it's trying to pass by a magnetic field, the force says, turn left, turn left, turn left, keep turning left, keep turning left. You turn it left. And what happens is the electrons just spiral up and around and around the magnetic field, but then they can bounce easily from end to end. And so they change the magnetic field lines. One magnetic field line that has more electrons on it will be brighter. The next, the next magnetic field line that has fewer electrons will be dimmer. And so for us, we see the magnetic field lines, which is amazing because they're really only constructs. <laughs> they're just lines of force. There's no reality to a magnetic field line, except that every field line has its own population of electrons uh, that it knows and loves. So <clears throat> um, here's a movie One of the end. So um, if you could see the moon's shadow on the earth, it doesn't look uh, nice and tight. It's kind of soft because f from the moon's perspective, 99% and 100% is not that different. From our perspective, 90%, 99% and 100% is a lot different, okay? But looking at the shadow from above, it's hard to tell where totality starts and where it isn't. Here's another one of the 2017 eclipse where you see the, earth, the moon's shadow crossing the earth. Uh, and, oh yeah. And this is one the, from the one I was just at in Australia. This incredible video shows the shadow of the moon passing over the Indian Ocean, Australia, and Indonesia through the total solar eclipse on April the 20th. This view of the eclipse was captured by Japan's Hibawo 9 satellite, which sits around 36,000 kilometers above the surface of our planet. So, the only part of Australia that saw totality was the little teeny tiny tip, and yet quite a bit of Australia saw 
some of the shadow. <clears throat> In a lunar eclipse, the moon travels through the Earth's shadow. If you were on the moon, it would be a total solar eclipse for you. But the Earth appears four times as big as the sun. The land around you gets dark. When you are completely in Earth's shadow, the land around you is red. The only light that reaches you is red light bent by Earth's atmosphere. Oh, I, I want to ask you one thing, though, um, before I move off of annual eclipses. And I've asked this to some of my planetarium friends. Uh, I just went, I was at a planetarium conference last week, and I, I posed this question to them, and it, most of them have eventually got it, but they needed some help. What does the supermoon and the annual eclipse have in common? What does a supermoon and an annual eclipse have in common? So we've had we've had a couple of supermoons. We're going to have one more. Okay, what is a supermoon? It's when the full moon looks extra big. Okay? The moon's orbit around the earth is not a perfect circle. It's an ellipse. And so for part of its orbit, it's closer to the Earth. And for part of its orbit, it's farther from the Earth. It makes an ellipse. It's only a few percent different, about 5%, but it's still very noticeable, okay? So what happens is, if it's a supermoon, that means when it's full, it's close to the Earth, okay? So what phase is the moon when it's farthest from the Earth? Well, the opposite of full is new. And what phase is the moon in an eclipse, a solar eclipse? It's new. So the point is, if you've got a super full moon, that means you have a mini new moon, and that mini new moon's just not quite big enough to cover up the whole sun. And that's why the eclipse is an annular one if it's near a supermoon. Now, these are some pictures that I've taken on, my, on some of my trips that I, I like to do fish eyes because I put them in the dome. And, and so it, this shows all the horizon all the way around. You get the sunset, except right underneath where the shadow is. I call this one Dragon Eats Moon uh, because there was, a, there was a cloud there that looked kind of like a dragon. And we had to get in a bus and move two miles to get out from under that cloud. Uh, this is one that was uh, off a cruise ship in Australia. It was in the morning. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It was in um, uh, Libya in 2006. And uh, the because it was near local noon, that that uh, uh, sunset was all the way around. <clears throat> now sometimes the the clouds are a little, you know, scary. Or is it going to clear up? Is it not? Uh, this was one that the kind of the clouds came and go, but we still had a pretty good view. Uh, this was the one from Wyoming, 2017, where. It was really spectacular. And this is one in China in 2009 when it was pouring down rain. <laughs> but, you know, it got dark and the, all the lights turned on. I also got clouded out in Antarctica. I went to Antarctica and that was really a sad, sad thing to go all the way to Antarctica and, and, and see clouds. But we did also get to see some penguins, so I'm happy. All right, so um, eclipses are just plain fun to watch, but there is some science that you can do with them. And, and I want to, to encourage you, if you go, to, to, to take a look and see what, what, uh, what you notice, okay? Um, the temperature will fall, and the temperature will fall a different amount depending on 
whether it's total or not, whether it's summer or not, um, but generally the temperature will fall. The shadows start to get really sharp. Um, you, the birds will start to roost. The temperature falls, the winds pick up generally. Uh, the clouds become more transparent. And, and that's a really interesting thing. I, the first time I saw that, I thought it was the hand of God and I was grateful uh, <laughs> that, you know, it was a thin clouds, but just around totality, you could see through it. And then after totality, it closed back up again. And the, the, the situation is when the, when the sun gets skinny, there's not as much scattering. So you don't see the clouds. The clouds are still there. You just don't see them because they're not illuminated by the sunlight. And so you can see through them. So don't give up. <laughs> now, diamond rings are, are some of the prettiest. This is what I was mention, mentioning on the, on the animation, that you get these ring rainbows sometimes. Uh, and uh, now some of the cool science you can do is to, to take a picture of, of the corona in two different wavelengths of light um, because <clears throat> the corona has line emission from different uh, atoms, uh, mostly ionized, uh, in the sun's corona. And if you look at this spectrum, you'll see these little semicircular uh, uh, arcs. Those are all spectral lines that are visible in the corona. And if you've got uh, uh, iron uh, XIV, which, which you'd say is 14, but it's 13 times ionized iron, okay? It takes a lot of energy to, to ionize iron 13 times, 3.6 million degrees. Whereas to only ionize it 10 times is only 1.8 million degrees. So they took a picture in that green line and they took a picture in that red line and superimposed it. And you can then tell what the temperature of the corona is. And what you find out is where the corona is trapped magnetic fields, where the electrons bounce back and forth, it's hotter. Whereas in the poles where the magnetic fields are open and the plasma can get out, uh, the, the corona is cooler, <laughs> only 2 million degrees. <laughs> now there are some cool, there's a, a neat uh, iPhone app that they promise is coming out and it, Every time I check, it hasn't been posted yet. Maybe it's there now, but it's called the Globe Observer, and you, it uses your phone so that you can measure light levels and add your data to everybody around the country. Uh, but uh, they claim it's coming, but I haven't seen it. Uh, one of the uh, Eclipse Science projects that I'm working on is called Citizen Kate, and Citizen Kate is going to take uh, 40 telescopes spread out along the center line of the, uh, of the totality so that at any given moment, two of them are in totality in case one of them is clouded out. And uh, instead of just looking at the sun in white light or in a sp particular spectral line like that other one, this one looks at the sunlight in polarized light. Okay, so the, uh, the polarization of the light is what the electric field is. And in normal light, it's, it's not polarized at all. It's, it's all different directions, okay? Now, when, would you, when do you use polarized glasses? Why, do you, why would you use polarized sunglasses? Yeah. A glare. A glare, right. And, and what's interesting about the glare is if I'm looking down, I, I want to see the fish under the water, right? <coughs> but that sunlight coming down bounces off the top of that water and it's coming in my eyes. When it bounces off a flat, it becomes polarized horizontally, okay? 
So you take your sunglasses and they are blocked. They, they block this polarization, but they allow this polarization. So it still allows you to see the background, but it reduces the glare off the water or off the hood of your car when you're driving. You don't want that glare. That's why polarized lights start, are really handy. Polarized sunglasses are really handy. Well, what this does, it has a 4,000 by 4,000 uh, imager. Here's the telescope. It's not a huge telescope, but here's the imager at the end. It's 4,000 pixels by 4,000 pixels, but every fourth pixel is a different polarization. So it goes this way, this way, this way, and this way, and then that is the same as that. So that gives you all the way around. And then we come back and color code the image, and this is what our data from April looked like, okay? Remember that magnetic field is almost radial, okay? And remember what I told you that the electrons are going around and around the magnetic field? <clears throat> Guess what? They are polarizing the light this way, okay? So <clears throat> here in the green zone, the magnetic field is this way, so it's polarized that direction. But here in the blue zone, the magnetic field is that way, and it's polarized this direction. So it makes a, a beautiful rainbow all the way around and it's not just that's real data that's not just somebody's having fun with crayons <laughs> and by by measuring the polarization of the light we can understand the depth of the corona which is what we're working on with this citizen kate project <clears throat> and uh here's a kind of schematic of how we're going to be uh, setting up the uh, the uh, cameras but we did a shakedown in Australia in April to uh, make sure all the uh, equipment was working right, and it did. Another cool thing that happens in an eclipse uh, is that because you're in the moon's shadow, the sunlight's not hitting the upper atmosphere, and so it's not ionizing our ionosphere. So our ionosphere goes away. <clears throat> because it needs that steady flow of sunlight to keep uh, kicking off those electrons. As soon as the sun goes down, those electrons find their friends in a big hurry. <laughs> okay, And this blue shows the less ionosphere density here uh, in the shadow. This was from 2017. Uh, compared to the ionospheric density around it. And a lot of ham radio operators are going to be doing uh, eclipse observations uh, with this. All right. <clears throat> so what can you do uh, with a group if you're going to have a group? And, you know, this it's three hours long, so it's fun to have something to do. Uh, one is to punch holes for pinhole pictures. You can measure the temperatures. You can use a sunspotter. You can t take a camcorder on a, uh, on, with a solar filter and put it on a TV that everybody can see. You can take a reading chart to see what the smallest font you can read uh, based on how the light level is. Uh, you can <clears throat> photograph the little eclipse uh, crescents or in the case of the annular little rings uh, under trees. And in fact, uh, one of my friends is having kind of a contest Everybody tries to get their best picture of a little eclipse under a tree and tell them what, at, or a bush, and tell them what kind of bush it was. And we'll try to figure out what's the best bushes uh, to, to get uh, the little eclipses. It's basically a lot of little pinholes. <coughs> Monitoring animal behavior. Another fun thing to do is an Oreo eclipse timeline. So if you've got kids, Table and, and some Oreos, and you take the lid off. Okay? <coughs> so now you got the white part, the cream, that's the sun, and you got the lid, which is the moon, and you have the, have your children look at the sun, and then they place the lid back on the white Oreo to show the progression of the eclipse and and put their time the, uh, uh, the, the, of their observation and 
and try to create this time, kind of like I showed you in real, real pictures, but now with the rates. How are you going to do the annular? You just bite off the edge of the, <laughs> the top of the Oreo. <laughs> so the top of the Oreo is a little smaller. <laughs> so you get to eat a little of the Oreo to, when you have an annular. <laughs> And so here's just a, 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 a sample data sheet you could do for for the for observing uh, observing the w winds and temperature and clouds and a data sheet for anim animal and bird behavior. Now, what do you do if it's cloudy? <clears throat> you know, it might be. <laughs> you can still measure the wind and temperature changes. You can still monitor the animal behavior. Uh, you can still monitor. Uh, the the light level because the the lights will come on. Uh, I like UV beads. Uh, they <clears throat> they glow in colors in the sunlight, but turn clear. <clears throat> and and you'll still get the body experience of totality even if it's cloudy. <clears throat> All right. So how do I observe it safely? Eye protection is really really key. And and what you want to do is make sure you put filters on the front of your lens, either the front of your camcorder, your front, <clears throat> he's got a lens here on the front of his, of his, um, his camera, but you can put the, you can even use uh, these kind of, uh, of lenses and put them on the front of your camcorder or your telephoto lens, but just cover everything that's cardboard up with a bl heavy black tape. I like gaffer tape because it, it's not sticky. <coughs> but for, don't put the eclipse glasses on and then put the binoculars in front of them. That's what happened to this guy. So he, he had his regular binoculars, but he put his glasses on, eclipse glasses on behind the binoculars and the binoculars, uh, concentrated the light. So you've got to have your filters in front, not at your eyes. <clears throat> now, one thing I just invented this year <laughs> is, is my solo cup projector. Okay? So what you can do is you can take a plain plastic cup, doesn't have to be plastic, it, it can be anything that's opaque. It can be a paper cup, it can be a styrofoam cup, but it has to be op opaque. And then you can cut like a half, half an inch hole in the bottom, okay? The problem with pinholes is that, that they dim, okay? And the further away they are, the dimmer they are, okay? So, <clears throat> but with, uh, if, if you put a lens, then it will focus and you can cut that hole much bigger. So this one here, has a 2x reader. I've taken a pair of cheap <laughs> reading glasses, 2x reading glasses, and that will uh, focus an image of the sun at a half a meter. So you take one over that number, okay? Whereas this one here, it's much further away. It uses a 1x reader, so it, it makes an image at one meter, and it's twice as big. So it's about a quarter of an inch for a 2x reader. It's about a half an inch uh, for a 1x, and for a, uh, 1X reader. And uh, I can get readers at the, at the Dollar Tree for a dollar and a quarter, two lenses. Now, you can go one step further and get a half a diopter lens. And those you have to get from an optical shop and put it on the end of a rolled tube, and now it casts an image that focuses at two meters, but again, it's twice as big. So it makes an image of the sun that's an inch across versus a half an inch across. Uh, and again, it's just a fun thing to do, guaranteed not to, uh, not to be dangerous, and costs almost nothing. <laughs> you can also take a Ritz cracker. <laughs> uh, this is what I was telling you about trees, that the trees will cast 
little eclipses. That was one at sunrise. And so it was casting them on the vertical face of a building. If it's more near noon, you'll see it on the ground. <clears throat> Straw hats work really well. <laughs> if you like your hat face covered with eclipses. Um, this is one of my favorites is to take a card piece of stiff cardboard and punch any design you want in it, your date, your name, your town, and then take a picture of its shadow. And each of those little punch holes makes a little eclipse. So those are fun things to do. <clears throat> eclipse shades are cheap, uh, but they have no magnification. So you can't see things like the, um, like the uh, um, sunspots, okay? The next best one, and again, I like to show you things that don't cost much. These you can get from Amazon. They're called the Clip Smart. Two for twelve dollars, and it comes with a mat. And they're a factor of two binoculars. So you squeeze them to open them up, and it's easy to see. Can't see anything but the but the sun, <laughs> but it's easy to find the sun. And what's nice is they fold up nicely and it protects, protects them. So these are, are two for $12, and I really recommend, you know, going in with a buddy and, and ordering one, and you take one and he takes one, and it's, and it's very handy and not expensive. <clears throat> By far the best way I like to observe eclipses is to take a pair of good regular binoculars and put a... Uh, a special solar filter on the front. It's the same kind of material as this, uh, but it's got a, a circular housing so you can pop it on and off for totality. But the really important thing you have to have is this tripod adapter. It's, it's an angle uh, piece that, uh, that screws into the hole in a pair of binoculars has a screw hole. Uh, and, and then it'll go into regular photographic tripod. And it's just enough to hold your binoculars steady because it's hard to find the sun in a pair of binoculars. <laughs> they, they have a small field of view and it is dark. Uh, so that way you find it on, the, on a tripod by looking at the shadow, making the shadow small, and then you can uh, uh, have everybody go by and look through the binoculars that each person doesn't have to find the sun again. You've got it in your, on your tripod. But when the filters are in it, the best way to find the sun with the filters on is to close your eyes and make your face say, I'm looking at the sun. And then you, with your eyes closed, then you bring the binoculars up and then you open your eyes. And then often it helps to have somebody behind you to say, oh, tip up a little more, tip a little left, tip a little light, they can kind of help you find it. But in Houston, the totality is going to be very high in the sky, and that is a neck killer. Uh, so uh, having them on a tripod is really, really handy. Now, the other thing you can do is project through the binoculars. Now, if you can't afford or you can't find them or they're sold out, what you can do is you can take your handy dandy solar glasses, cut them apart, and tape one half on the front of your pair of binoculars, okay? Don't let anything in except the light has to go through the filter. Make sure all the cardboard is covered with your tape and no gaps. And then you can use that binoculars uh, to look at the sun, and you'll get a much better view than just uh, with, with uh, the solar glasses alone. All right, I'm going to have to go a little bit faster, but another thing you can do is to take that same pair of binoculars and project an image through the binoculars onto a white card, and that works well, but you do have to be very careful and not let the kids look through that because it does not have a filter on it. Uh, here's another one where I've taken the binoculars on a tripod and there's the image down there 
and then I'd wrap it with some black fabric to give a bigger shadow so you can so you can see the image in the shadow better. You can also take a, a normal telescope and use it uh, to project an image. Okay, so everyone should have their own binoculars for totality. Sun spotters, I really like these. These are not cheap. Uh, Dr. Coiner has bought three of them for you guys. Yay. Uh, and they make an image which is like four inches across, which is awesome. And really, you can see sunspots well. And the other thing that's good about sunspotters is they work even if the sun is nearly overhead. Um, so I really recommend them, and they're completely safe. There's no way anybody can get hurt with them. Okay, well, um, at this point, I think I'm going to stop and allow some questions. Yes? Is there a way that someone um, in the public could recreate that really cool heat map um, that Map oh yeah. Made from the ionization energies of iron. Yeah, no, those, that was actually done by amateurs. But what's how, tricky how is, is, is it, it's a special filter. So you need to restrict it to those two wavelengths. Or yeah, time. it's 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 a very it's a very it's a very it's a very fine filter that only allows the light from that one wavelength of light uh, because otherwise you'll get. Um, the the continuum light of the sun. Which you can't fancy post process the continuum away. You have to use the filters. Yeah, yeah. You, you need the, the okay. really the you need the high quality. You can't just use a green and red filter. You have to have one that really selects for that very wavelength. Just like uh, there there's a H alpha telescopes and they look specifically in that hydrogen line and that way you can look at the convection on the surface of the sun and the prominences. But if you just said, give me red, you'd get all the red light and you wouldn't, it wouldn't be as good. But good question though, good question. Well, we may actually have an each alpha scope at the, or we can do the observing. Yeah, and I have a H alpha telescope too. Um, we have we have a bigger one that rides on a, tra on a tracking and that's really nice. Uh, I have a hand one that's more just on a tripod, and you have to keep moving it. And it has terrible eye relief, so it's it, you spend all your time aligning it, in my opinion. But it is neat, and you can get a you can get a preview of what the what the prominences are going to look like before totality with with an H alpha telescope, which is kind of cool. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Well, they they think it's nighttime, so the birds will start to roost, the dogs will lie down, the sheep will gather up, the deer will you know they'll do nighttime behavior in the middle of the day. And um, the funniest one was I was in a cruise ship in uh, uh, in, in the Caribbean. And the uh, it was almost totality. I mean, it was not you know just moments from totality. And four dolphins came <laughs> up and broke the surface, and they're going. <laughs> they had no idea what was going on. <laughs> we all just. I mean, we we were expecting we saw the pelicans coming into roost, but those dolphins, we all just fell out. We were laughing so hard at these dolphins who had never seen totality before. <laughs> but they knew it was they knew it was they knew it was not not right. <laughs> so, but uh, so those are the kind of things to look for roosting behavior. In fact, one of the funny stories we tell in the in the totality show was in the 1878 expedition in Texas. Uh, Edison brought a, uh, a detector to try to measure the temperature of the chromon. It's a different one, but it's also a spectral. Okay, but just not as sophisticated as this. And he set up his experiment in a chicken coop. And when it got dark, all the chickens came back. <laughs> 
and messed up his experiment because they all came back into his chicken coop. <laughs> so he measured the temperature of the chickens instead of measuring the temperature of the sun. But those are the kinds of things that an to look for with animal behavior. And, and you know, the thing that grabs me, I, I went to uh, the Texas State Aquarium in Corpus Christi, which is right in the path of the annular. And I said, this was the summer, I stopped by there, and I said, you know, what are you going to do for October 14th? And they said, what's happening on October 14th? <clears throat> and I said, uh, <laughs> you're in the path of an annular eclipse. It's going to get dark here. Do you have eclipse glasses ordered to sell? Do you have safety posters to put, put up? Do you have somebody planning to monitor what your dolphins are doing? What your sea turtles are doing? I mean, what a wonderful place. You've got all these creatures already there. You know, you can just watch them. And they go, uh... Well, we're having our our gala the night before. I don't think we'll have any volunteers. What? <laughs> so anyway, at least I told them <laughs> to pay attention. <laughs> they might not listen to me, but at least I can say I told you so. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things. I think last week you were having a we were having the, or two weeks ago we were having the Oregon Space Grid Consortium meeting here, and some of the and some of the guests were staying over at the mill, and they started quizzing the mill about about the, about the eclipse, and they weren't necessarily aware that there was an eclipse coming. So it's one of the few places in, in the area that you could actually still get reasonably close to the center line until uh, on, the, on the 14th, because all the other main like resorts around here have already kind of filled up and we're hopeful the weather will cooperate. It is the coast of the middle of October, so we will we will speak all the positive thoughts of the year. <laughs> what one of my friends at who was in Carolina during the twenty seventeen eclipse, just after it was op over and everybody was starting to go home, he he pulled up the Google traffic map. And you could see exactly where the totality was. All the red, <laughs> all the roads were red in the path of totality. <laughs> it was just, uh, so yeah, traffic is going to be insane, uh, especially in totality. But the world just stops for three minutes. <laughs> you know? How many of you have seen totality when it was here five years ago? What was the best thing you thought about it? What was the coolest thing you said? Surprised how cold it got. What? How cold it got. Cold, yeah. Yeah. I, I asked my daughter-in-law to measure the temperatures for me. And I gave her an electronic thermometer and a notepad. She was writing down every minute or two. And I said, man, you, you had a 20 degree Temperature drop? That seems like a lot. I said, where were you, where'd you put the thermometer? And she said, you know, in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> no, you measure temperatures in the shade, <laughs> so your thermometer doesn't heat up. So uh, her thermometer had a 20 degree temperature drop, but the air was not, not that much. It was only, but it was still a lot, it was like 12 degrees. It was, it was significant. And it just gets creepy. I mean, it's just eerie, you know? The sky, when the sky is normally that dark, it's usually red because of sunrise or sunset. But it's gray, <laughs> you know? It's, it's, I mean, you know, I, you know something is happening. You know something is going on. And you know why the ancients were so terrified of it. Uh, when, when the sun was your god and the sun went away, then you can... Really. All right, I don't want to hold you any longer. Any, anything else? Yes. Is there a specific place here that we can go to go see the reality? Is there like any specific place we should be? I, I think what you're saying is it's going to be as dark as totality for the annular. No, but it's still going to be pretty good. I mean, it'll be it'll be close. It'll be like ninety percent. 
And 90% is when you really start to see it get dark. So yeah, you, you guys will really start to see it get dark. Not dark, dark. It won't be dark, dark, dark. But it'll be, you know, early sunset. Okay, well, nice talking to y'all. Stop. Close things out.